Um, I first heard about the Millennium Project 20 years ago? 1991 or two. Close, yeah, somewhere around there. And um, I, when I was at EPA, and I actually in, invested in them, and it, the return on investment is my is clearly my best investment. Uh, I, I had a portfolio. <laughs> I had a portfolio of probably 12 or 15 futures projects. This one is still going, um, and, I, and I think the Millennium Project is, is a good example of constant methodological innovation. Uh, even if you're interested in the older methodologies, they have the best encyclopedia of methodologies that's out there. Um, so I think one of the things that they've consistently done is is sort of innovate, and you're going to see sort of the next stage of that and what that looks like. And I think they've sustained themselves. Uh, this is what the 17th, 16th or 17th State of the Future report, which is really, if you've been in this area, quite an astounding accomplishment to be able to year by year turn these out. And maybe we'll move to a virtual, you know, <clears throat> constantly updated version soon. Um, but that is an amazing amount of sustainability. So, and I feel I still think we're grappling with the issue of, of actionable and how do, how do we do that? What does it mean? And I, I hope we'll have some discussions. In the end, it, it's it's a collective problem, and you're part of the solution because you all live in institutions. You understand the culture, the institutional processes that go on that that make people pay attention or not uh, to this kind of output, even if it's done in a very rigorous and methodological way in a consistent way. Um, so those were some of my reflections on, on 25 years of doing this. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, and I think we're, we're going to go down the row. So um, Jerry will start. We have uh, one large slide set, and Paul has a few slides. Uh, we have to, let me just, a word of warning, we have to get out of here around 1.30. So, um, 1 30 or 2.30? Huh? 1.30 or 2.30, wasn't 1.30. 1.30, okay. So we're going to go as fast as we can, and we'll, we'll try to do some Q&As definitely at the end. Good, okay. Hello, everybody. After that introduction, uh, that's if you have no further questions, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, let me take care of the commercial stuff off the bat. This is, if all goes well, maybe the last annual State of the Future report. Uh, so get your antique ahead of time. Um, now, I get overruled quite regularly by the Millennium Project around the world, so that doesn't mean that that's, this is what will happen. People still want to have physical books. But the idea of doing an annual report, a slice in time, has value, but in my judgment, less so as the speed of change and knowledge and so forth continues to accelerate and get interdependent and all that sort of stuff. So this is a print-on-demand sort of a thing. So you can get this. Uh, those that want to save some trees, you can get your flash drive. Same deal. It's got all 10,000 pages. Now, this thing has, as you, for those of you who don't know, we give the short stuff of uh, like one page per challenge in here, and the, the detailed futures reports, a few pages. But then what's behind it is about 10,000 pages. Right? So we don't expect anybody to read 10,000 pages. You pick out what you want in your keyword search and so forth, but it's all there. All of that now is in a flash drive. So if you don't like the 10,000 pages of research, you'd, you, know, you can put your own memory stuff on here. We also have it for CD-ROM. We also have it download. And now we have it in a collective intelligence system for the first time. So all of the stuff of the Millennium Project, all of it is online, all of it is interactable, and all of it can have comments and groups to discuss these things and update all the time, including methods as well as the challenges. That's the theory. A year from now, we'll see if that holds force. OK, why? The world, as we know, is in a race between implementing, and I liked what Dave said about the implementation. We have known what to do for years about all kinds of things, but we don't get it done. Uh, to race between implementing uh, ever-increasing ways to improve the human condition and the seemingly ever-increasing complexity and scale of problems uh, and collective intelligence, in my judgment, can help. Because we put next to each other the different positions as much as possible. So it's not, it's not an optimistic statement, or it's not a pessimistic statement. It is both. There is stuff in there that's scary to death. And there's stuff in there that will make you think everything's going to be fine. And the answer is it's a little bit of both. The pessimists don't know about the best stuff, and the optimists don't know about the worst stuff. So we're going to have the pessimists and the optimists together. Okay. Uh, we need a way for the world to think together because if the United States does all these things good and glorious, it doesn't mean the world's going to work. If the European Union does everything great and glorious, it doesn't mean everything's going to work. 
we've got to have it as a human family. So we as a human family need a way to put our brains together in some organized, coherent way on an accumulative basis, which is not a General Assembly of the UN. That's nation-state systems, and it's a one-shot every September. That's not obviously doing it yet. So collective intelligence can contribute. I'm not over-claiming on this, but it can, it can contribute in this direction. It is an emergent property. I do not mean uh, a database as such. I mean an emergent property, as we talk about in chaos theory. Emergent property from the synergies among data information, knowledge, software, hardware, experts, as well insight, that continually learns from feedback to produce nearly just in time knowledge for better decisions than these elements acting alone. The old days, the wise ones would be brought together, you have a discussion, the decision is made. Then along comes the internet, and people say, oh, I gotta just search the internet, and we get a decision there. And somebody else says, no, no, the mathematicians, like West and so forth, will say, no, we put some models together and some mathematics and decision matrix, and, we'll, and then we'll get a decision. The answer is it's all three, and the all three so that they can interact with each other and change each other. The results out of computer models ought to change the content. The content ought to find new people with new experts. New experts ought to have different ideas. The, all three of these should be interactive and changeable all the time. So we all know the reasons for this. I won't bore you. Uh, everybody in this room wouldn't be here if you didn't understand that we are overloaded with answers. We are overloaded with goodwill, but we are not harnessing us in, in an obviously clear way. Who was it? Edison wrote about the, the, the energy uh, uh, crisis coming up in the future and, and the coal would eventually go away and oil and that sort of stuff. And we're still acting as if we're not doing any, very little action on these things. Okay. So the 15 global challenges, um, I won't go through all of these, just mention very briefly. These are the things that we track on an ongoing basis and we'll put it in, and it's now in the collective intelligence system available for commentary and updating and improvement by everybody. And where there are differences of opinion, we can put them together, we can put them in discussion groups, we can put them in the Delphi's, and then the answers we put feedback into the system. So how can sustainable development be achieved for all while addressing global climate change? How could everyone have sufficient clean water without conflict? How can population growth and resources be brought into balance? How can genuine democracy emerge from authoritarian regimes? How can policymaking be more sensitive to global long-term perspectives? One of the things that Dave and everybody in the room to some degree is working with here. Uh, challenge six, how can the global convergence of information communication technologies work for everyone? How can ethical market economies be encouraged to help reduce the gap between the rich and the poor? How can the threat of new and re-emerging diseases and immune microorganisms be reduced? How can the capacity to decide be improved as the nature of work and institutions are continually changing? How can shared values and new security strategies reduce ethnic conflicts, terrorism, and the use of weapons of mass destruction? How can the changing status of women improve the human condition? How can transnational organized crime networks be stopped from becoming more powerful and sophisticated global enterprises? How can the growing energy demands be met safely and efficiently? How can scientific and technological breakthroughs be accelerated to improve the human condition? How can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? We believe that this is the global agenda. It has come to this point through a large complex system around the world. Some of you probably know we've got 46 nodes now around the world. And we have nodes in Tehran and Tel Aviv. I don't care whether you're right wing, up wing, down wing, whatever you are, you're a human being. We're looking at human being, intelligence being brought together. So this is not a think tank on behalf of the United States. It's not a think tank on behalf of a particular issue. It's not a think tank on behalf of a particular ideology. It's a think tank on behalf of us. So us are the ones that are supposed to be involved in it. And we don't have to agree on everything, but we've got to get it on the table and get it organized so that we can feedback and learn in a cumulative way. That's the idea. Okay, now, skip from there. And seeing as how uh, Silicon Valley always has a glitch on its demonstrations, we will see if I can um, duplicate that and have a glitch somewhere along the line. Uh, I have my genius next to me to make sure that doesn't happen, though. Um, now, so this, we have not put all the aesthetics in here yet. This, by this time next year, it should look quite beautiful, and you're going to go, ooh, and ah, I hope. 
I hope you'll go ooh and ah about what it can do right now. Okay? So here's the 46 nodes around the world just to sh show people that when you come in, there is a little red box there you can click and go through an introduction. I'm not going to do that because uh, I'll give it to you personally. The 15 challenges are down here. If I click on a challenge, let's see. And of course, it doesn't come up. Why is there? We go. All righty. There we go. Well, I'm an impatient guy, you know. All righty. So now, in the past, all of the uh, 15 global challenges, all of the 15 global challenges were in this overview. So the state of the future that you got out front is now one of 11 options at this point. So if I click on overview, you get the same one page uh, overview of the challenge that you get right now. Uh, and you get, uh, as you get in a longer version, all the detail comes underneath each one of these sort of things. Okay? So in a sense, the entire state of the future is duplicated on one of the options. Now what we didn't have in the past, what we do have now, and I am pushing hard on, is making the best situation briefing charts existed on the planet on all the major issues. Uh, this is not necessarily the briefing chart that will be done by a particular organization. It's going to be us, our human one. We can argue about what is the current situation, what are the most important things to know about challenge one on sustainable development and climate change. And we can argue about that. And we can keep changing it. All of these things are changeable. Now, then we put underneath each, each of this what, what that refers to. Well, there's 394 parts per million uh, this year, at the same time next year, last year, 92. Before that was a little less. Okay. So then I can also then click on, well, where does that actually come from? And it tells me it was just updated five days ago. And then I can click on to this point here and go, go further. So like any sort of normal system, you can, you can go drill down. So all of these things are drilled downable, and all of them are changeable, and all of them can have comments. So if I come up to here, I can make a comment. On your list of current situation, you totally left out X, and here is a good source for X. We can take that comment, we can bring it over into a discussion area, and we can bring that in and discuss it. If it needs more serious analytics, to go through that particular idea or that discussion, then we can go over to another option of a real-time Delphi. And we can put that right in the real-time Delphi without leaving the platform. As an answer becomes clear, either a bimodal distribution or a consensus, but no more new information is coming in, we've got an answer, then that can dumped into the situation chart or into the overview. And new questions can come in. So unlike the old Delphi, this is one of the technological, uh, new methodological innovations, by the way. In the, uh, the, you had regular Delphi of rounds, and you had real-time Delphi round list. Now here's another one, where the Delphi continues on indefinitely. And you change your questions through time. And you pull out your answers as they become clear. So it's, it's like an ongoing stream rather than the old concept. Okay, so that gives you a little flavor. So you've got the situation charts on each of the challenges. And one of the things that I like, and I hope you will like, is the idea of reviewing the world. Because people keep saying, I can't wrap my mind around the world. It's too much. Okay, well here's an approach. Here you've got your situation chart, you go through it. Then what I can do is, it's not only drilling down as you just saw, but I can also go across. So instead of just doing the, the situation chart on one, I can go, give me the situation chart on water. I can see what's the current situation, next steps, and so forth. Then I can go on to the next one, on population and resources uh, situation chart, and so forth. So within like 15 minutes, I could go through 15 situation charts and see what's changed, what, how the world situation going on. This can be like a mental exercise to get a feel for the whole world. Now, uh, this also has the idea of news feeds. So any, each of the 15 challenges also gets its own news feed. New news feeds can be added. Old news feeds can be deleted. Information can be rated. And it tells you where this information is coming from down this side. So if, some, so if there's a source of information on news feeds that you're saying, wait a minute, you're leaving out the best information there is on this. 
so we can add it in. Or if something else is consistently so-so or not quite relevant, then we can delete it. The news feeds then, we can take a look at these things and I can move this item over to a discussion area. I can maybe make an edit on a content and associate it with it. Wes will show you a little bit about this later on. But all of these things have options behind them as well. So you right click on these as you go along. Now, scanning, your normal sort of scanning system, but that is not an automatic. The news is an automatic system. It's just throwing in news information. And you can search, by the way, because there's too much news on each of these 15 challenges for you to read every day. I guarantee you. <laughs> but what you can do is you can search in each of those categories. You saw that little search bar up at the top there. Uh, the same thing with the scanning. The scanning, though, hasn't. So there's been some value added. Somebody actually adds in and can annotate and make comments about why that scanning item is interesting and why it's important. Um, and then you can also search, so you reorganize all the scanning items relative to what's important to you. Then uh, we have the next thing over here, our comments. This is a new feature we just put in, we just put in yesterday, we'll see how it, how it holds up. But all those comments before in an area can be organized. So I can see what people, this is like the general public. Remember before, Evan, what, Evan, by the way, wave your hand. Evan was a former intern when we were <coughs> discussing how you'd actually make a collective intelligence for real. And we always had the idea that you gotta have the back door for Bucky Fuller's that didn't fit in the original game. So, but at the same time, I've been doing, my first e-wheel was 1973, by the way. So I have watched consistently through every system I've dealt with. Excellence is driven out by irrelevancy. You, know, you get a group together, you put some excellent people together, and then you open it up, and then the quality goes down, and then boom, it dies. So my answer to that is have both. Let anybody make a comment, but they don't necessarily get it into the formal areas. All right. So you, you, you keep the idea of the back door, but don't let it drive out your best people. Because if you go to a mathematics conference and somebody says, prove to me one and one is two, unless they're really philosophical, they get annoyed. Okay. Uh, now, another thing that's a feature in here, which is nice, is because there's a lot of information in here, well organized, coherent, organized, but still a lot of information, we have an option here on updates. So if you're doing democratization, for example, it tells you what edits were done and when, how long ago they were, and they put them in context. So you can keep track of all the edits in the system, when they are done, in what context. This is extremely transparent system because of that. And then you can organize it by day or week or month and so forth. Digest. Let's say you want to say, well, tell me, I just want to get uh, the key uh, scanning items, uh, the key updates, maybe some news items, but I want everything. So you can click on digest. So what you can do is you can take digest, and then just like I did with the situation chart, you can go through. Give me the digest on challenge one. Give me the digest on challenge two. Give me the challenge on... Th so you can quickly go through a lot of complex material this way. As you can tell, we're working very hard to make this easy, but not compromising on the detail. Then, discussion area. Each one of these ten challenges has a discussion area. And a person can initiate a discussion. It can come from a news item, from a scanning item. You can just start it fresh by yourself. And then other people can be invited in to talk about it. The results of the discussion can then uh, be, be put into the situation chart or put into a real-time Delphi or put into uh, the overview, depending on what's relevant. And then again, I just showed you the real-time Delphi option. One of the things that I like about this that Wes has put together is that you you can uh, let's see if I take number six here on because I just did this one recently uh, you can customize each question differently. So for example, here's a question on what percent of humanity over six years old will be using internet by 2020. All right. Well, in this question, we want to know what's the best possible worst value of worst most, or least likely uh, and what impact of this variable. And then you can also when you put it in, you can also put content. So you can explain your answer. But but different questions should be answered with different organizational structures. So you can do that this way. Next are models. This is something that uh, I'm also sort of excited about. All of us hate some models and like some models. Um, what we want to have on the model section uh, is um, 
three categories of models. One, mathematical models. Two, rules-based models. And three, conceptual models. In my judgment, all three are relevant and all things sh all should be here. But imagine that you have an international peer review system of the best models in those three categories for those 15 challenges. That alone ought to be useful. So then when you run the model and it comes out with something that doesn't make sense, you can jump over to the discussion group and say, that model makes no sense because it doesn't have this variable, this variable, and this variable, and it totally throws off the forecast. But you're vetting it through an international system again. And then the last category here is resources. And we, that's into three categories as well. Um, the, the first category of resources are websites. What are the best websites to go through? If you want to keep track of the best information on a particular challenge, what are the best websites? And we can argue about it. We can put in a real-time Delphi and vote on it. We can keep, we keep doing it. So like, this is something, again, that keeps changing. Hopefully the list that you're looking at right now will not necessarily be the same list in a year from now. So that's one. The second are books. Uh, some of you may know Michael Marion uh, with Future Survey that moved into Global Foresight Books. He's now turned his stuff over to the Millennium Project as a repository. So these books then are in here. So you can take a look at the book. You can click on one of the books that are selected uh, by his book review s system, read through it, and if you want to, you can order it. Then the third category under uh, resources when it goes back up here, are papers. Uh, is Paula Gordon here? Paula is one of the first papers to go in the system. I was, re I was clearing off my desk. I found a paper that you wrote, what, 10 years or more ago? 1996. The damn paper's good. And just because it's 96 doesn't mean it's not good. So I said, this ought to be one of those papers that we ought to put on the record, so to speak. So then she says, well, well yeah, but let me mess around a little bit. So okay, so she messed around and we put it in. So if you have papers that for whatever reason is not politically okay to publish, or for whatever reason, and you think it's really important to the world community to understand, we can put it in. You know, as long as it doesn't advocate something illegal, we'll stick it in. And we can even then do a discussion around it as well. Okay. Now, so that's the, the way that the 15 challenges are organized with a menu of 11 options. An incredible matrix of information. That's home. Next is research. <laughs> this is all of the research stuff that we've had before. Now this is interesting. In the past, I, some of you may know, I've worked for a bunch of different think tanks in the past. You do, a re, you do your research, you do your publication, that's it. And then Dave holds up your report 10 years later and says, here's this, here's this study. We want those old studies to be alive. So if you go through, let's say if we take one of the, old, one of the previous studies on, say, um, oh, I don't know what we got there, science and technology or environmental security or global ethics, or whatever it happens to be, you can go to that report, you can make comments, and then we can start a discussion group around that and maybe edit it. Everything can be changed. As information comes into your brain, you reassociate, causes changes in your brain. Information changes its meaning through time. Not always static. Doesn't have the same value, same meaning of the information. So all is up for grab. Now mentioned, Dave mentioned about the encyclopedia stuff on the methods. Here it is right here. So you get all of the methods. This is about a thousand five hundred, thousand three hundred pages of stuff. I don't expect you to read all this either, but it's the largest compendium of futures methods ever put together. Uh, and each of these can be updated. So, like for example, I just mentioned that we've changed Delphi method a little bit with a new system of continually adding questions and taking them out. Well, that means I can go into here the Delphi method, and then we can make some edits. We can bring it up to date. So instead of waiting five years for version 4.0, it would be an ongoing process <coughs> as much as possible. Um, I th there's, there's more to say, but I've got to stop at this point, I think. And I want to uh, give back, oh, oh, sorry, just a couple other things. Here's a bunch of groups. Uh, there's a bunch of re other Delphi's that we're doing, and all their nodes are interacting. You see what they're doing. The About takes you back to our regular website. So those that are familiar with the previous website and you still want to use it, you can. It'll be updated too, but we'll have both. They're inter interactive. And then the last one, which I've not mastered yet myself, uh, is a Google Hangouts. So let's say if, if a bunch of us want to have, or any user, with no permission, you can start your own Hangout. 
But the, the advantage of doing it here is that then you've got all the rest of the platform to back you up. So if you're having a discussion with 10 people around the world and you want to bring up some information and discuss it, you can do that, which is different than just doing a normal video conference. I mean, I can do it. We do it sometimes, but it's a but bulky. This is a slicker operation. Now, one of the uh, things that I mentioned in here was that a challenge, any of the content of any of the challenges, any of the models, all that sort of stuff, can be modified, can be changed, can be criticized, can be updated. But then how do you, not, you, you see how you know because the updates tell you that. But there's also the idea of linking those changes to other stuff. So if you had a hangout discussion on some foreign policy issue, came to a conclusion, and then as a result of that, you edit something on peace and war. You click on that edit on peace and war, and it says, and you can right click and find out where to come from. And it says, Google Hangout. You click the Google Hangout, and you see the video of how these people came to their conclusion. That is, if you want to record it. If you don't want to record it and keep it quiet, that's your own business. So, Wes, if you can show them uh, just a little bit about how a piece of information uh, can. You want to use this one? Yeah, I guess you'll have to. Uh, yeah, sure. And the mouse is over here. I'll just switch switch seats for you. Okay. Now, while he's doing that, Wes, um, we went through a process of trying to fire, find a, a hot shot person who would understand what we're talking about. And we'll take a chance with us because they're going to be here. Still still here. And uh, Wes threw us away uh, a couple of things that I'll embarrass him about. One is that as we're talking about what we want to do, the, the four of us were in video conference during the interviews. And he came up and said a couple of times, well, actually, I ran an independent experiment on it a couple of years ago, or a year ago, and I found this. And said, Whoa. He didn't wait for a contract to do the discovery. He didn't wait for a college paper assignment to do the discovery. He said, that ought to be figured out. I'm going to try to figure it out. That's the attitude of the uh, So Wes is our chief information officer, and he wrote all the jobs that we chose to see. Hey. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about in the system, uh, what's there already, is the uh, editing system for the text content on the challenges. The idea is that it's a continuously updating text, but every time an update is made, um, there's a lot of data associated with the update. And so you can go through the text from its evolution from some point in time to see how it was edited over time to get the, the, the current version. And every time it's edited, you'll see, for example, the default behavior is to show the last month's worth of edits in, highlighted within the text. If you click on the edits, you'll see certain pieces of information. This was edited three weeks ago and associated with the following item. Um, what that tells you is that this item right here, which I think is a news item or a scanning hit, I think it's a scanning hit, was what motivated this change in the text to be made. There are um, a lot of things you can associate and edit with. The, the scanning hits, the news items, the models, the resources, discussions. I think discussions is one of the more interesting ones because then you can see the actual discussion done by the experts that motivated a certain change in the text. Um, that gives you a lot more information than just a static text page would give you because every single word eventually in this document will be linked naturally back to what motivated that text to be added. So a lot more contextual information. Um, <coughs> the updates page is where these edits are kept individually. And I'll just show you really quick how it's possible to associate one of these edits with a piece of information. First inspecting will tell you what it was up, uh, associated with already, if anything. And then associate with item. So it wants to know what sort of item you're looking for. This is in case you remember an item. There are other ways to go through this process. If you add a scanning item to the system, it gives you an option immediately to make it an edit based on it. But if you've made an edit, edit and you want to associate it with an old scanning item, you just click, um, let's see, what sort of, I don't want to want. Let's just say I'm looking for one of the scanning hits that was associated with carbon. So I know there are some of those in there. 
This will pull up all the scanning hits that have carbon in their content or in their titles. And you click one of them, and then is this what you'd like to choose? And you say yes or you say no. And this way you can add a lot of information into these edits. Jerry also mentioned Google Hangouts and how those are associated with the edits. I think that's an interesting feature which is not really fully developed, but it works at the moment where if you're in the middle of a, a Google Hangout, which is basically a video conference between yourself and several other people, um, you can pull up all of the items from in the challenges into the, the Hangout and manipulate them from within the, the video conference. If you make an edit to the content of the system while inside a Hangout, the video recorded video of your video conference will be associated with that edit and the specific timestamp in the video at which you made the edit will also be associated. So you click on the edit and you get a video of what was going on in the conference as the edit was actually made. Um, let's see. I just added the comment section yesterday which I think is pretty important um, because all of these items have the ability to be commented on uh, not only the scanning hits and the news items and those independent pieces of information, but each edit itself you can be commented on. Each section of the text content in the overview and the situation chart can be commented on. Um, for example, here's an edit that was made that I added some comments to. And click that, they'll come up. And then if you go over to the comments section, um, it'll show you the most actively commented on items in this challenge over the past certain time span. So over the past week, these were the most co active conversations. You can go hour, and over those, m the last hour, what are the most active to get really up-to-the-date conversations if you want to join in, um, and then for the year, for the big stories. This is different from the discussions in that comments can be made by anyone who has access to the system, a subscriber or a viewer or whatever, whereas the discussions are supposed to be available only to the experts. You're going into the discussion to see what an expert has to say. And then if you're a layman or somebody who's not actually part of the system in an expert capacity, you can still comment on the outside of the discussion or on any of the comments made within this discussion, but you're not actually added to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I know that you're getting one bath of a lot of stuff. <laughs> I apologize. But one of the things that you can do here, uh, if you come on yourself, even if you don't sign on, even if you're not a subscriber, you can come as a straight tourist, is you can click on this thing here about introduction. And it'll give you this little next arrow, and then you can take yourself piece by piece through it. If you say, I got it, I don't need any more information, you go over to the left side, and you click off skip the tour. But just to very quickly just give you a sense of what it's like, it explains all of the, the various elements that we've been talking about. As you go through as well, what is this? Right, click on that it's telling you how to use the system. Click this one? Yeah. Look where the arrow's pointing. Ah, oh. Oh, right. So I got to do this one. Yeah. Create it. Mm -hmm. So I go next there, right. Yeah. All right. So that's later on. You can sort of take yourself through that. Now, what I'd like to do, uh, who prefers to go? I can, either way is fine. You want to go in straight order? Or? It was Leon, dude. It's Leon, right? Le yeah, Leon. Okay. Um, anybody doesn't know who Leon Firth is here? <laughs> you know, I actually, <laughs> what are you, a philosopher type? You know. <laughs> uh, Leon uh, just did the, that, you want to hold up the report there? Evan, you got it? Oh, there you got it right there. Just did this great document. Uh, I was very pleased to be part of the team. There's several people in the room here part of the team as well. Uh, it's, it's damned important for us to get the uh, global perspectives, futures perspectives in the strategic planning process in the United States, let alone the rest of the world. I gave a briefing on your system, by the way, uh, Leon, uh, over in Korea a little while ago. I hope this report uh, is well received, and uh, I hope that the Millennium Project and uh, its collective intelligence approaches will play a role. Leon. So what would you like to hear? The truth. <laughs> What's <Okay>. useful? <laughs> Well, originally, um, you were asking me to um, to answer a question like, um, if you had had this system back in the day um, when you were in the administration, what 
um, decisions were taken that might have been made better. Um, and I began to think about that and eventually concluded that it was like saying if you had had oh, Gatling guns at the time of the Revolutionary War, um, how could Washington have done a better job of mopping up the British? Um, or if you're in London, maybe the question would be reversed somewhat. Um, it interests me more, um, based on the experience of having been involved in making policy, to ask how can a capability such as this um, improve the quality of what we get going forward, as opposed to retrospectively. Um, because the, the means to go forward with something like this are in existence. Um, a decision to go forward with it does not require a billion bucks and a 10-year R&D program. It requires um, a political impulse <coughs> to bring something like this um, into being in close connection with policy. So as I sat um, listening to your presentation, um, I threw out my former notes, how's that for the usual dramatic opening, um, and began to think about the policy planning process. Um, ordinarily, what we call the policy planning process resembles a mill for producing uh, crisis management options. Very little time, um, very uh, high pressure, um, and um, ordinarily under hostile fire, whether it is from um, an enemy, an insurgent issue, or uh, never to be appeased or reconciled political opposition. Um, but it's aimed at producing specific policies, that is, statements of how power will be applied um, to, to results. Um, and very seldom is it aimed at analyzing the actual systems by which policies are planned uh, and or executed. The, the principal figures of an administration don't have time on their own to revise the system. They tend to work with the systems they, uh, they inherit, and they may or may not give much thought to how the characteristics of those systems limit um, the range of things that they might um, think about or take action on, but they do. It's like the, it's like the characteristics of a musical instrument, and um, you have to wonder um, what Mozart would have written if in his day it had the equivalent of a modern concert scale grand piano instead of um, something that had to be pounded hard to make, uh, to make music. So uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the policy planning process as opposed to specific issues that this process churns out. Um, and this is an area where I think that what you've been developing um, should create new uh, possibilities. Uh, in the high-speed, hothouse atmosphere of um, an administration at the most senior levels. The first requirement when you are dealing with a, um, an unfamiliar policy issue, and by the time these issues get to the national level, they should be unfamiliar, otherwise somebody else should have been solving them. The first requirement is to get a sense of the structure of the elements of the issue, especially um, the way in which um, segments of the of the issue interact with each other. As you know, our, our system is organized around encapsulated expertise by bureaus, agencies, and so on. Um, but the way the world works is everything is highly interactive with everything else. And the system is not that good um, at asking questions about those interactions. So uh, I think, as I look at the briefing materials, um, that the very first thing that you could use this thing for in a policy planning process is uh, to scan for uh, the structure of the questions, the way in which issues and forces interact, especially the question of their, of their interaction. Um, in complexity, um, you have to accept that uh, it is very artificial to designate one force as driver and all other forces as driven. 
Um, the requirement for wisdom uh, or mindfulness about policy um, is to have the sense that change anywhere in the system induces changes throughout. And then the question is, how, how do these elements relate to one another, and how do they move each other in a dynamic rather than a static sense? I think in, this is very compatible with what you've been describing <coughs> as the characteristics of the systems that you've been defining. So if I transpose that to the question of how policy should be made as a system, um, it comes down in, in language that I've been using to this facilitates um, the conjoining of foresight as a discipline process and policy as a discipline process responsive to it. That would be um, its uh, first and highest contribution. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the places where you would connect this piece of equipment uh, is in the policy planning mechanism. Um, and the way in which that could happen is relatively simple, um, hard to get, but simple. Um, and that is the president indicates that information about policy should be formatized, formatted in such a fashion as to identify the principal issues and their interactions, as opposed to the standard method, which is to, to dissect the thing out into uh, issues and to pick one arbitrarily or for political reasons um, and concentrate on how that one factor is going to somehow influence all others. Uh, we can call this AKA the golden bullet, the silver bullet, which no one ever really finds. So my first response to your question about what role can this play uh, in a real world policy planning process is to be inserted for the purpose of scoping the question and of, and of making sure that there is a minimized chance of going into action with policies that have failed to recognize critical questions and to deal with them first. I mean, it's an excellent system um, for identifying the component issues of a dynamic issue uh, and for helping to focus on what it is that needs to be understood about that issue before uh, you send troops to the field um, or money into the pit on these things. And that, I think, would be a very high contribution. However, you talk about noise in the system. There's only one way to make sure um, that a system like this can be run or chaired um, in a fashion which permits respectful hearing uh, of different points of view, but the power to, to suppress the noise at the end. And that is if it's connected to a president who wants uh, to be sure that what is sent to him has run through this kind of discipline. So I think that's the basic way in which um, this connects to a real policy uh, process. It obviously connects um, very well at, at lower levels um, in the system. It's the kind of thing that you'd want to see analysts in the policy shops of the executive branch agencies using. It's the platform for discourse that you'd like to be able to resort to when people say you want to get everybody on the common on the same page, it isn't at first that you want them to embrace the same solutions. It's that you want them to have the same conception of what the hell the problem is to begin with. And after that, the search for, uh, for what is the right action um, begins. Otherwise, it's more like, um, what is it, roller derby? Where, <laughs> where the sharpest elbows may win the, um, uh, may win the game. So I'll stop there. Uh, if people want to follow that up later, that would be fine. Thank you, Leon. Oh, you have some slides. You want to use those? Or uh, I, I have a couple slides, but I might want to start out by trying to imitate Leon. I don't think I could do nearly as good a job, but, notes, but it's right? a nice model to try to follow. And first I'll throw out the notes, but maybe I'll get back to the slides. You can use mine. They're, they're reusable. <laughs> reusable <laughs> notes. Okay. Um, I, I was going to start anyway with some general observations, saying the same things Jerry has said in slightly different language. Um, many years ago, I used to be a futurist. I worked at the Department of Energy. I was responsible for long-range energy forecasts. And I rebuilt a lot of the econometric models to make them more accurate in predicting energy. So I'm very much tuned into the requirements of the mathematical way of doing things. But if you work in a serious way with mathematical models, you also know they have very serious limitations. 
So if we want to do the best we can to understand the future, we need both elements, sort of the human element to elicit what comes from human brains and the mathematical models and figure out how to make them work together. One of the projects I worked on long, long ago was the phase two of something called the Global 2000 Report. Dave, you, you emboldened me to talk about the more recent past. Uh, about 1980, I think this was the last of the really serious big quantitative models. And Jimmy Carter said, you government agencies, you have all been working very hard on understanding and modeling your own sectors. But what happens when you consider the connections and put it all together? What if we make these models speak to each other? What happens? And what happened was you came up with a totally different picture of the world. The feedback effects between sectors and between nations are just totally essential in driving the future. And so somehow or other, if we care about the future, we have to try to understand that. Now let me say the reason why I'm here, <laughs> it's not because NSF asked me to come here. I'm grateful they're tolerant of me coming here. <laughs> Nothing I say here represents the official views of NSF. But I'm, I'm really here, frankly, because I worry about whether we humans are going to survive or not. And every hard problem I've seen, from you know, building an airplane to a better car to an econometric model, you aren't going to find a solution that works if you don't think about the problem. And if all you do is follow lots of little astrology rules, I went by the book, I did this little thing, I have my stovepipe, I fought my turf, if nobody thinks about how to win the war for survival, we won't win it. We need a vehicle for the highest level of intelligent thinking about how to survive that we are capable of. And it seems pretty obvious that to do that, we need to bring together th serious thinking from around the world, not just protocol bullshit, of which there is plenty. Um, we need to find a vehicle for bringing it together. Now, the system Jerry has just described is clearly the alpha version, first version of a new direction. And anybody who's discovered the ways people can screw up in the world you know it's not going to be perfect. But this is where we start. Jerry is starting from the only framework I know of that really brings together really substantive discussions from all over the world in an integrated framework. And so if we think it's imperfect, our first duty is to try to figure out how to help and how to help make it better. Because the responsibility itself is a matter of kind of life and death. So now maybe I'll play with my little slides. Okay. Uh, if they're the one here, uh, they should be here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, about three of them. Let's see. Now, why is this not taken off? Let's do, do it this way here. Ta-da! Is this? No, that's not it. Did they load them on here? Do you know if they got? Ah, Warbos. I heard of him. Okay. Okay. Hold on here a second. Here we okay. go. Okay. So, yep. at a certain point when the energy trends got to be depressing and <laughs> not easy to change, I shifted over to NSF for several reasons. And one reason is it gives at least some vehicle for trying to change those trends. Um, so my present position at NSF, there are three core responsibilities. One of them is a program called Energy Power and Adaptive Systems. One is Intelligent Systems. And one is some hairy quantum stuff you might call a wild card. In the energy area, uh, a year ago, NSF asked me to give a broad talk on all the things going on in energy at NSF. It's posted on the web at the director's website. Um, I don't want to belabor that, but the people who came to this meeting from engineering departments all over the nation wanted to know what are the opportunities for us to contribute? How can we make a difference? So if we jump to the next slide. The problem is the amount of money to fund research. The funding rates have dropped dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, something like 2003, we were able to fund maybe 30% of the proposals that came in the door in my area. But there were a lot of cutbacks in basic research in the Department of Defense, in NASA, in industrial laboratories, all over the country. And sometimes I think we got these homeless refugees coming in with huge technical talents, much of the support of the whole American economy was coming to us for funding, and we just couldn't fund them all. 
So what did we do? Well, we did the best we can. We have a triage process. We can fund 50% of them. I'm a little worried at this rate. Is half the technology base of the country going to just retire as they get frustrated with 15%? But right now, I have to tell people who are hungry for money, who are competent, what do they have to do to get funded? And of course, first they have to tell us what they're going to do. We're not going to fund a project where they don't really clearly say what their goal is. And they have to convince us they've got a good plan for getting there. And that has always been true. You could never get NSF funding if you didn't meet those criteria. But more and more, when there are lots and lots of good projects that cannot be funded, branches of science that cannot be funded, we have to make a triage decision. What's important and what's not? So more and more, the decision of who gets the money has to be based on what's the most important thing. And we use two criteria, one of which we call intellectual merit, one of which we call broader benefits. And the key question I have to ask my panels is, if this work results in a breakthrough, if it works, how important is it in improving the future of humanity? Now, if you've ever sat in a room with bridge builders and civil engineers asking what's most important for the future of humanity, you have to understand there might be a way to improve the process. And, and one of the reasons I try to interact with Jerry and this global community is I want to upgrade my knowledge, because I have some input to these decisions, because in the end of the day, we have to decide what's most important to humanity. When, when you talk about other agencies, my vision of this thing, it, it comes from economics and Pareto optimality. At the end of the day, every agency or corporation is going to have some core missions. And in NSF, the core mission, number one, is this intellectual merit, understanding the universe, basic science and design. But in every agency, Competence in your core mission gives you special assets that you can leverage to help other tasks that are not in your core mission. There were some classic papers on the economics of defense by Hitch, you probably know the, the book, uh, where they showed that if the Army, the Navy, and the Marines each choose different utility functions because they have different values, you end up with inconsistent and inefficient decisions. You, you have to have consistent values somehow. And the way I would see doing the consistent values is you have a broader impacts criterion, as we do. And every time you see a way to help the rest of the world in ways they can't do because of your special advantages, you, you, you account for that in what you fund. So this broader benefit stuff is really, really serious. Decisions at all levels of the government, you ultimately have criteria you're playing to. And it's important that these criteria really reflect where you really want to go in the world. So final slide. Um, another reason I'm interested in what Jerry is doing is from the other end of it, not as a user. But one of the areas we've done a lot of work on is trying to understand and build intelligent systems for engineering, like aircraft, electric power grids, but also to understand how brains learn to be successful over time. There's a lot of neuroscience that just studies things like gates and chemicals and molecules. That has its role. But we're interested in the functional issue. How do you achieve intelligence? What is the mathematics of intelligence? And we have learned a whole lot in recent years about those questions. A lot of this hasn't got out yet. It may be like a wild card a few years beyond Kurzweil. There's really amazing stuff we already know. And I've been asking myself, how does that apply to the kind of thing Jerry wants to do? If we want societies, if we want people working together, public and private, whatever, if we want to work together to solve very hard problems, what are the requirements for something like collective intelligence, for being able to work together more effectively to achieve a goal? Can the mathematics of intelligence give us some idea of what we know? Well, one thing that's very obvious if you study something like a brain is that foresight and prediction are absolutely central elements. You, you can't achieve a better outcome if you have no idea how things work and where you're headed. And that's kind of comes back to why this is an important effort. But that's only part of it. Um, there's also a thing called option generation. And I think that's part of the role of this system. But the bottom line is there are a lot of things you need to do to build up intelligence. We haven't got them totally embodied in the new web page. We got a few generations to go. But, but I think it's a really important challenge. So, thank you.
Thank you. Okay, we've got some time for questions because we're uh, webcasting. I want to make sure. I think we got microphones. Uh, so please raise your hand if you've got a question. Just uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, we'll start. And also if you want to address the question to a specific person. Hey, Andy. Look at your mic. Hold on. Uh, we'll have to toss it to you. Yeah. I'll bet he can catch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Andy Reynolds, Department of State. Uh, Jerry and the team, actually all of these folks. Uh, we just had the benefit of Global Trends 2030 from the DNI, the publication. And I wonder just simply, did the team, which went extensively around the world to build consensus on the document and on the forecasts, did they also benefit from the Millennium Project and use your Delphi method to help identify issues that they thought were gaps, for example, thought should, that they thought should be analyzed in the process? Thank you. Anybody here from the NIC? Anybody here from the NIC? Going once, going twice, no? Uh, the, the very first ones, we were more formally involved. A lot of our people are involved, but not as Millennium Project. Uh, they asked about methods and so forth in the early days, and they don't need us for those now. They've, they've learned independent. Uh, we take the report. It's in the uh, in the collective intelligence system uh, under resources under uh, challenge five. And as we gin up and open this up to everybody, uh, that I am sure will be one of the discussion items. As a matter of fact, Andy, if you want, you can come into the system, go into challenge five, and you initiate that conversation. What do you guys think about the NIC? report. Yep, right here. Uh, yeah, Chao Chen, Best System Maryland. Uh, I have two questions. First is this, how t how to update or ed addition from the people outside the system? And uh, is this a system going to break down from the world to the region or the nation? Thank you. In the uh, organization of the 15 challenges, uh, you'll see an outline for each challenge. Uh, the outlines naturally have to be a little different for each challenge, a little different. But some things are in common to all of them. One are regional considerations and countries within those and, and sections within those countries. So you can go to a challenge. Scroll down to the bottom of the, the, the table of contents, click on Latin America or whatever it was, or Middle East, and, the, and then those areas specifically to that challenge for that geographic area. So yes, we do the local, we we'll also do the global together. Uh, to your first question, this is something that is in motion at the moment, but here's where I am at this point, and don't be surprised if um, Wes contradicts me in the next couple of seconds, because we're still in process on this. But a think tank is supposed to be able to do that. This is the difference between a regular organization and a think tank. You sort of like have some arguments and you come up with some good answers. Now, the way we see it right now is you have uh, about two or three editors that actually will handle the edits at this point, because we're just beginning. They are fed from uh, the leading experts or facilities for that challenge. Like, for example, in energy, one of those uh, is Paul Werbos here then within that challenge there might be 50 to 100 reviewers. Right now there's something like 100 reviewers in some of the challenges and some have only like 11 to 12 because we haven't finished finding the best people and inviting them yet. So you've got your final editor, or editors plural, uh, you've got your facilitator or leading experts for that challenge, uh, then you have a whole lot of reviewers, and the reason there's 50 to 100 reviewers is because we're all busy. I mean, everybody in this system is busy, too busy to do what we're asking them to do. So uh, you might only have five reviewers on something out of 50 or 100. That's okay, because not everybody knows everything about a particular area. So you're in the areas you're, you're in. And then those suggestions then go back up to facilitator, and they can, they can approve, and then say, ah, then the editor can stick it in. Now, below the reviewers are also subscribers, people who have you know, their company or their government has bought an access to the system and they can make suggestions. The suggestion isn't automatically going in, it goes to reviewers. So there's a peer review process, 
But unlike a professional journal peer review process, we don't say here are the 10 reviewers and you've got to get three to say yes and then wait six months before it goes in. That's why we got 50 to 100. So if the reviewers, if, if I don't get, if I only get, let's say I got five reviews within the first couple of weeks, of course, couple of days, then that's enough in my judgment. It may not be perfect, but that's where it is. Then you also have the fifth or sixth level at this point, the general tourist who isn't a subscriber. Like anybody in the room can sort of come in and you can make some comments. And we can see those comments and those comments can inform us to discuss it, then go up through that little quick hierarchy. That's where it is at this point. Wes, do you want to? Yeah, we're starting to get it close to the 130. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's do one more, see how far we get. The regional get. stuff. Hi there. Um, it's regional first. Yeah. Thank you. Just a, a quick question. Um, I'm from the Embassy of South Africa, and my question relates to the... Your government was the first government to buy. Right. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, it's your Ministry of listed. Science and Technology Science. It's, it's the Science and Technology Department. You, you, first government to buy. Congratulations. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, the age profile of your 4,000 participants around the world, if yeah. you could just uh, briefly elaborate on that, and why I ask <clears throat> in South Africa with our national development plan, which we developed over the past three years. It was developed through basically a, a Delphi method, but I then um, in a few rounds of editing, one of the rounds included an online um, discussion forum targeted mainly at people in their teens and 20s because the rationale was that a 30-year development plan needs to target those people because yeah. they'll be the people implementing the plan in their productive decades. So um, what do your participants around the world look like, and are there any com interesting comparisons between different countries or regions? Yeah. Well, we can certainly give you, uh, in the into the future report, good for you, very good, and we thank your government once again. I want everybody to remember, it was the South African government was the first government, by the way. They weren't the first buyer, but the first government buyer. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We have, all right, in, I can give you, first off, uh, the participants in our work last year, uh, about 50% was from Europe. Um, about uh, a quarter was from North America, which includes Canada and Mexico, I believe. No, it doesn't, because Latin America is another one. The next largest was Latin America, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia. In some years, Asia has been the largest. This is a slice for this year. Uh, I do not, we didn't publish for some reason the total, annual totals. Because usually we do the totals as well, but you can probably get them online, the annual totals. So we, and we also, um, the, this year, the largest number was academic, then other, whatever that was, uh, government, uh, private sector than NGO. It's, it's, it varies a little bit over the years. Um, the age, we have not, I don't know, we can do this, but when we do a Delphi, uh, the new Delphi that Wes has put together, when you, cust you can customize it. So you say, what are the demographics I want? You put in whatever one, and then you have the scale that you want. Uh, and we have not usually asked for people's age, but different Delphi studies we've done have asked different questions. I can't tell you right now the average age of our people. I would suspect it's over 30. I expect the education level is somewhere between a master's and PhD. Uh, I think the largest number of all of our uh, years put together, Asia I think is still number one, Europe is number two in, in regional stuff, then North America, Latin America, and Africa. Yeah. And we're very happy South Africa has been one of the a uh, active members of the Learning Project for a long time. As a matter of fact, that for the record, when the first South African citizen went up in that uh, quick reusable citizens test, not the, the two year, but the original was a South African, and that was up when we were at CSIRO or whatever it's called, the science thing there. Same day we, we opened up in South Africa. Okay. So we got a line of nice carbo with you guys. <laughs> yeah. We can do uh, one last question, then we can, we're can. we going to have to get out. We can obviously move the conversation out, out outside, but uh, yeah, over against the wall here. Yeah, I'm Jim Disbro, and I'm with the Millennium Project in a couple of different capacities. But I have a question for Leanne Firth. Uh, dealing with complexity analysis and the union with strategic good analysis, and d how do you see the strategic goods and the complexity analysis intersecting within this 
structure. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly in terms of the ones that, that uh, were mentioned earlier with the, the, the food and energy, but I would also include environment, which I think was part of the climate thing, and water as, as four strategic goods, because it's really at the nexus of where all these emerge as strategic goods that you have conflicts. Uh, but anyway, could you comment on that, please? I'd like for you to just expand the question a little bit. Um, it's, it's, it's like being served a huge slice of, we should excuse the environmentally incorrect image, but of prime rib. <laughs> juicy falling off the plate. Let me hear this again. Um, consider four strategic goods, all of which are tightly intertangled, mm -hmm. uh, and they include food. Uh, think uh, we're now feeding seven billion people. We didn't, when I was young, think we could even feed three and a half billion, and we're going towards ten billion. And this is clearly one of the the, the critical uh, strategic goods. Uh, energy. Uh, we are running through this uh, whole energy thing. Uh, environment, all the effects of the first two on the environment, because the, the Haber-Bosch produces a lot of fertilizer that feeds a lot of people, but it also produces these swirls in the middles of the ocean that are just dead. Uh, and uh, 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 water, uh, so we've got food, uh, energy, environment, and water, where water is a another constraining resource and is predicted to be a, a major global uh, warfare causer. But we haven't seen any because people actually do cooperate over water. So could you comment on, on how this process that, that we're unfolding now uh, might contribute to the understanding of that at, at that nexus? One of the things that attracts me to the process is that it's iterative. Um, I'm not sure um, that policymakers can use a continuously shifting stream of information they have to sample um, or rather than be plugged in constantly. But the people, um, the people who formulate policy choices and images of what may happen um, are in positions where they can more or less um, um, keep up with the sampling frequency of the, of the system. And if I understand your, your question, it is um, how does the system help you um, come to grips with the interactions among these particular drivers? Would that be a, a fair way of paraphrasing it? Well, to take an example of where we failed um, to have the ability to do this, um, we spectacularly failed to understand the implication of um, ethanol policy for food process, prices around the world. Um, I don't think we have come up to speed with that, with that yet. Um, I don't think that we um, particularly well understand how drought um, in major food growing areas of the world, especially let's say in the United States, will interact with these things. Um, uh, and the urgency is that the droughts here, the trend is established, um, the impacts on food supply um, are visible already, so it's not as if we have a long period of experimentation and com and uh, and contemplation. We're in the uh, oh, we're, it started, and we're we're in the thick of it. Um, the question is, sorry, I'm improvising an answer, but then your question is sort of pretty spacious. Um, I'd like to be sure if I put myself in the position of someone getting a briefing, which is the composite of of all this information. I'd like to be sure. Um, that I understand what interactions this briefing is revealing. Energy prices, fertilizer, uh, transportation, food, consumption patterns, changing levels of wealth um, and shifts in uh, the demand structure of, of, uh, of regions of the world. Um, because otherwise what will happen is, is that there will be a seemingly clear uh, but actually too narrow assessment of what is interacting with what, and you come out the other end with a, um, with a crimped idea of the range that the policy has to, uh, has to cover. Um, I'm struggling uh, to, to come up with an answer in a few more words that'll, that'll decently respond to your, to your question. But it seems to me that the main thing first of all, is to understand how many things you, as the uh, analyst presenting to policy, how many things you 
feel need to be highlighted as interactive elements of the process so that you know that when you consider a possible action or set of actions, you've had some chance um, to assess the consequences of moving in a direction. What did I turn off this time? Okay. <laughs> uh, let me stop there and, um, and give you a shot at a clarifying question, if that's acceptable. Yeah, I think we're going to, I actually think we've, re we've run out of time. I think you have. So I've saved you that one. All right. <laughs> no, I would like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang around and listen to this. Perhaps in response, you could sleep on it. That's a room until 2.30. <laughs> <laughs> so let me join me in thanking um, Jerry and Wes and, and Paul and, and Leon and thank you for all coming.